we are going live hello everyone um i am danny terrell and welcome to intimate conversations central, central district forum for arts and ideas um i am excited to be here today with you all um i am excited for our guest today um someone i definitely love dearly uh, they will be coming on in a second. As you all know, we need to just do some business. Um, and we will get to that in a second. Just trying to type in some information, folks. I hope you all are doing as well as you can today. Um, I know today is another day. And we are in quarantine here. Um in Seattle, Washington, and that means a lot to folks. Um, so we are making it work in quarantine. Before we get started, as you all know, just have to do a little bit of business today. Um, our land acknowledgement. Here is Brian. Um, we're just starting off with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the land that is stolen from the, the traditional home of the Coastal Hamish people. The Duwamish ancestors were killed, brutalized, and stripped of their humanity. We lift up their work. We hold their pain and their joy as we honor them with our work today. Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas understands that we come from enslaved African people that endure countless acts of torture and humili humiliation, both during and after the Middle Passage, and we're still going through that today. We bring into this space the thousands of Africans that did not make it to see this land. The work we do today is on the backs and shoulders of the original people of this land and our ancestors who now guide us. We sit in this space to honor African people and their descendants and to give back to the original people of this land. To our ancestors, we thank you, we see you. We invite you into this space with us so we can lift up your names and honor you with our, our work. Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas is a nonprofit organization solely dedicated to presenting emerging Black arts, artists, and ideas in the Seattle area. We believe in the value of community, creativity, identity, and passion. These values serve as our strategic frame and guide our day-to-day -day operations and program decisions. All right, folks. It is hot in my house right now, so I am like sweating up the storm. <laughs> You know, when it's winter time, you try to control the heat and you are sweating up a storm. Um, that is done. I am super honored to, uh, as always, talk to Brian J. Evans. Um, we've known each other for now a little over two years. And I will definitely say this is someone that is family to me that I love, 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 love dearly and that will be in my life for the rest of my life. Um, and you will see why if you don't know him, you will understand why. Yes, I think his praise is a lot because he is truly just an amazing human being. Um, and so I've asked each guest, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm just hot. That's why I'm kind of frazzled right now because I'm just like my own private summer going on and I'm trying not to turn on the fans and I'm going to get cold. So bear with me while I'm trying to like deal with this heat wave that I'm having right now. Um, I ask each guest to answer this question or answer the conversation. Black love looks like, and this is what Brian had to say. Black love looks like hope in the eyes of those who have been told that they will never know love, yet experience it despite the world's efforts. I'm going to read that one more time. Black love looks like hope in the eyes of those who have been told they will never know love, yet experience it despite the world's efforts. Um, for me, that really sums up a lot of Black people's experiences. We continue to have hope despite a bunch of things that continue to happen to us. But before we jump in there, um, my first question to you is, Brian, what are you bringing into the space today and who are you bringing into the space today? Well, thank you so much again for having me for this intimate conversation. Um, I miss you. 
I miss I you, miss so, you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm bringing that into the space. Um, uh, I'm bringing my my grandfather John, who passed away in in, uh, in January. Um, bringing my grandparents, who are in Cleveland right now, um, and I haven't seen them in, in such a long time. Um, uh, bringing in my partner, who is uh, at a restaurant right now, trying to you know figure out how to uh, make ends meet with the very real prospect that it's going to shut down in the next week or so. Um, and today, today was a relatively good day. So I'm bringing, I'm bringing good spirits. I've been looking forward to this since I scheduled it like four or five months ago. I don't even know when I scheduled it, but, um, I'm so glad that we did. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, 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 I'm bringing, I'm bringing a a bit of everything. I'm, I'm kind of exhausted. Um, Mm -hmm. From the from 2020, what hashtag 2020 <laughs> has has done a number on all of us. So, oh yeah, tapping yes, into yes. that collective exhaustion. Yes. Um, I don't even know where to start. Like, I always prepare questions, and then I like want to ask other things. But, um, Brian, you are a citizen artist, mixing disciplines, mixing professions, and of mixed race. Brian J. Evans unpacks the moments of suspension that reside in the spaces between spaces. Convinced that connections exist between us all, and it is the responsibility of the arts to remind us to be holistically human, lest we forget. Courageous vulnerability and intentional equity keeps him aloft, aloft as he finds ways to give back and add to the community, mentors, and ancestors who blaze trails and continue to do so. Um, I was pulling something off your website, um, and it's something that really struck me, and it's just something just all, it's just who you are, but the way that you said it is so, it's not a but, and the way that you said it is so beautiful. Um, You said artworks, artworks because it helps with our, uh, let me read that over. Let me get myself together. Art works because it helps with our human capacity to love. Um, can, can you dig in a little bit more about what that means? Art works because it helps with our human capacity to love. What do you mean by that? Dig a little deeper, Brian. Uh, so I, I feel like in my years of being, uh, having the opportunity to be an artist um, mm-hmm. where and I think I, I, when I say like having the opportunity to be an artist, there's a distinction between like the world letting me make enough money to do that and right. uh, making the opportunities along with people giving me opportunities to like hone the craft. Um, so for me, education, arts, and healthcare are sort of like the last bastions of, of vulnerability that we have left that is sort of set up. It's like when you're sick, you need people to take care of you. Right. Um, when you're seeking knowledge, you need people to take care of you. And when you go to an art show, you hopefully have people taking care of you and considering right. you as you um, sort of be exposed in a way that might might present something to you that might completely change your worldview or tear down the way in which you see and and have stacked your beliefs on top of. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is, that is the ultimate expression of love. When you're trying to teach somebody, when you're trying to show someone something that you did and be vulnerable, when you're trying to um, take care of someone, those are the, those are the spaces that I think allow us as humans to tap back into that, that reservoir that in my opinion is always there, but society gives us a whole lot of reasons and puts a whole lot of barriers in place to tell us that we shouldn't love each other, to tell us that um, either they don't deserve our love or I don't deserve the love um, to give out or something like that. There's a a bunch of narratives around that. So for for me, art feels like... uh, it it allows us to sort of cut through all the bullshit and just get to like, I love you. And that's my starting place. 
Um, and although you may think a bunch of things about me, if I'm in an art space, I know that I can change your mind or I know that I can just be who I am. Um, and you can't help but love me because when I can be that and you can be that too and see that, I feel like that's unstoppable. I love that. Um, and my next statement, correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, things change, people change, but you are a mixed race, cis, straight male in the art world, especially in dance. Um, and you do other art forms also. But there's something about always lifting up. If you are a straight cis man in dance, you are lifted up in a particular way. You are held to a certain standard. Um, and I'm going to say held to a certain standard. People lift you up in a certain way, um, especially cis women. And the thing that, that I, I, I love about you is that you don't allow that to enter your space in a particular way. Hmm. You, are, you are about the love of the art and the love of people and not the love of self when, you, when I encounter you in art spaces and creating art and just as a human being. What... What is that like? Um, because I know there's a lot of cis men who thrive off of the other part of that. And you, <laughs> you really break down that and you really, like, I don't see you falling into that trap. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I feel like falling into a trap. That's an interesting way to, to, to phrase it. So when I learned about dance, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I was 20 and I was in undergrad and I happened to be in a liberal arts education and I happened to be in a dance program that was all about social justice. Mm -hmm. so, so those two things um, really never separated the art from the mission of what that art could do. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I started learning about social justice, I started learning about male privilege and mm -hmm. cis privilege and... Right. Uh, you know, straight privilege. I le started learning about privilege and learning the duality that I must hold because in some ways I'm marginalized, in other ways I'm, I'm the majority and I have a lot of power. And when I was able to, you know, go onto the dance floor and feel always like the novice and always like I'm, not, I'm never going to get trained enough. I'm never going to be able to do the things. Right. And know that I'm going to get more jobs and more opportunities than probably all the, especially in Minnesota, you know, where, where I forged my career because the diversity checkbox where everyone's like, we need a black male. We need someone exactly. that looks like me to be in the cast. Um, that cascaded into, you know, job after job after job. And so at once, I'm eternally grateful for that. But at the other hand, there's always a question of like, am I really supposed to be here? And mm. if I am here, who am I, who am I representing in the space that, that never got a chance, never would have even been looked at to have filled that spot? Um, and so it's trying to, trying to find that balance within myself because you know it also isn't a, a very good feeling being like oh I got this job because I'm not qualified but I have all this privilege so trying right. to find the balance of that um, and just I guess recognizing that I, n I never ever felt like I, I did things by myself ever mm. you know maybe and maybe that's being raised by a single mom you know so my, my, my dad passed away when I was seven and so her world contracted really quickly. She had three mixed kids and she was in the middle of Minnesota. And so mm -hmm. there was no, there was no, there was no possibility that she would be able to do that by herself. And yet as a strong woman feeling as though she had to, but it was the community. And that was sort of like my first understanding of like what it takes to get from point A to point B. It's like, you need your folks, you need your community, you need your people. And, and when you show up, you do your job, you do your role, you, and, and you know what your limits are. And you can't be doing everybody else's job because you have to rely and trust on them. So, and the art space was the most democratic space I'd ever been in. Not all the time, because, you know, people are on top and they, they alter 
that space uh, in sp right. specific and particular ways. But when it works, it feels like all the boxes that I tick are respectfully insignificant for the for the for the mission and the journey that we're about to partake and and ultimately communicate to the audience. So that's how I try to enter every space. I know that every time I enter a space, I'm, I'm already failing, uh, because I'm there, mm. you know? <laughs> so mm. there's a humility that comes along with that. Um, and a responsibility of like, well, if I am here and, uh, I'm thinking about harm reduction, how can I promote as much, uh, as much benefit from the space, not only for myself, but for my colleagues and my peers, so that we keep this train going because because again it's one of the last spaces and it needs to be sustainable right uh especially when the world is is trying to squash it out pretty yeah. regularly yes i agree with that you are it's so funny that you say that you walk into a face and you know that this space and you know that you've already failed and it's so <laughs> interesting to me because when you walk into a space your presence is so huge. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not an egotistical, it's not a, I am Brian J. Evans, I have a ride, but the love, the light, the kindness greets before anything else. And then for those people that have never seen him perform, you're meeting with this kindness and this love, and then you're just like, okay, okay, so let me just go back. The first time I encountered Brian J. Evans, he submitted an application for something, and I was just like, mm, it's all right. I don't know. Okay. It was showing out when a CD form shows. And so then I was like, okay, let's bring him into the show. And then I had a conversation with him, a phone conversation, because I believe I was in Texas at the time. And I had a phone conversation with you. And then you started talking about the piece you wanted to present. And I, I remember saying to you, what you said does not match what you wrote down. And I was like in love the minute you started talking about the piece. And so then to see you on stage, and so you meet this person with this kindness that comes out of them. And you're just like, okay, great, great person. Then they get on stage and start performing. And then you're just like, what the hell am I experiencing right now in the best way possible? And then I'm just going to give a moment just to give people a little bit more. And so then, so okay, great. He dances, he writes for you. are just like, okay, great. What else can he do? Then he's like, oh, I have a guitar. I can sing a little bit, which means a lot. So then he sings and then he does all of this other stuff. Then he's an actor. Then he like does stage work. Like, so you are just a full human being. So when you say that you've already failed, I'm going to fight you on that one. <laughs> because I think you set a different standard for people to to be as a straight male in the dance world. You set a completely different standard, in my opinion. Again, um, you you are an educator. You um, got your MFA and MFA candidate for the University of Washington. That's how we got connected. Um, and again, I'm in the hallway teaching and the students are just like, Brian, 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 Brian. And I was like, yeah, I know he's dope. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he is really. Um, what did you take out of that experience? Because you are, you were very much loved and you are very much missed. Hmm. Uh, I mean, grad school was one of those moments where, you know, it was grad school again, when I, when I think it works, when you're, you know, I was 33, I'm 35 now. So I'm going back into an education. I've had about a decade's worth of a career. And the reason that I went back, um, a couple of them was, first of all, I was seeing all of my, uh, amazing colleagues, most of them women, um, who didn't have an MFA were in their fifties and their sixties and their seventies, and they're still hustling. They're still, they're still doing the adjunct jobs. They're still doing, uh, you know, the grant grant funded work that's hit or miss or feast or famine. Um, right. and, and still, you know, being amazing, having their own companies, but it, but it was all unsustainable in the ways of which, you know, 
when you your body can't do the thing anymore, how then do you generate the funds? Um, and being pigeon held, you know, as someone that is just a performer, which is a, a in some ways kind of a yeah. A, Right. Or, or even like lo lower, it's like, oh, we're just a dancer. Like, what, the, what does yeah. that mean? Um, right. So wanting to go back to school and uh, figuring out, number one, I've been doing all this work out in Minnesota. What, what happens when I go to a new community? Is the stuff that I, that I believe in going to uh, affect anybody? That, does it right. matter? Does it work? And, I, you know, I was very close to not applying for cd4 mm -hmm. um especially because it was a black choreographer's evening and being mixed there's uh you know um, up imposter syndrome on top of imposter syndrome and top right. of imposter syndrome um and being in a new community but that was the goal that was like i'm going to throw myself into this community as best i can mm -hmm. and the interesting thing about the university of washington's program is that it is it is meant for mid-career artists that are trying to become professors. So there right. is a there is a pedagogical learning how to teach component. There is uh, your and you're going to be an employee. So we're going to you know have you teach classes and be instructor record component. Um, there's the student component where like you go off and you just go and you learn. Um, right. And then if you're lucky and you can schedule it right you can still be a performer because you're mid you're a mid-career artist so i didn't feel like i wanted to stop performing and creating and i think again between a whole bunch of privilege uh and being at the right space in the right time i got lucky in that uh i i hooked up with cd form very early on i met you very early on right and that was in a sense the outside work that i was able to pick up along with Rachel Lincoln and, and Avid, which is a more contact improv community. Um, and, and even like doing a workshop and, and doing uh, some youth stuff with Kaleidoscope. So, so I had all of these really interesting. And that was the crucible that I think in the two years um, mm -hmm. really f helped f forge uh, a lot of what I understand about my, myself, uh, the black mm -hmm. aesthetic, um, me uh, making work at, as someone who holds a lot of stories um, and then being able to write about it. And then coming across the realization that the English language is one of the worst containers <laughs> to talk about this kind of work, right? It's, yeah. like, it's, very, it's very pluralistic. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't hold m meshy, mushy meanings very well. It's very deterministic. Exactly. It's very linear. Um, and so the more I, the more I learned about this language, uh, the more I, f I, you know, again, I came back to the arts and I came right. back to the creative space and, and the learning space and the, and the healing space and being able to do all of those, all that like CD form, especially choreographers, choreographers, even the way that you and Sharon set it up was a teaching, healing and performative Thank space. You it hits all those three things and it serves the community. So in terms of how you create spaces that I think generate the most impact for not only the artists, but the audience and mm -hmm. whomever else walks into the space, I feel like if those are your guiding principles, that's, that's the way in which to really make art sustainable because it, right. it feeds itself in a way that mm -hmm other industries or other ways of modeling and doing that just just really don't so these last two years then that like descended into a covid pandemic like I, it was the most transformative time you yeah know, and now we're you know we're we're in a space where we can't do the thing that we normally did and so we're having to create and be creative again and so Again, I, I just think that the, the connective tissue is already there. Right. That's the reason art works. If it wasn't there, this would be non-existent. This wouldn't work. This wouldn't happen. This connection, even though we're 3,000 plus miles away, would, exactly. it wouldn't work. But it does, and this is a testament to it. So I, I, I don't ever fault the art. Um, it's just about how do we, 
how do we get ourselves out of the way? And I felt like grad school helped um, do a little bit of that and then helped me write about it. You're, you're right. When I wrote my application, I don't know how to write about my art. I, I feel like I, I can a little bit better now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, you hit on a few things, and I, and I, and I just want to say, I just want to acknowledge for myself, I think you came to Seattle at the right time for me being selfish, but I also think you came to Seattle for the right time possibly for yourself, for your partner, and for so many people, so many lives that you have touched here in, in the Northwest. Um, it, there is a void missing um, now that you are not here, and I don't say that lightly. Um, you really did bring something special um, to, to all of us, that whoever encountered you, you really did bring something special, and you challenged me personally in a really beautiful way. Um, Thank you. One one of the ways that you challenged me is on the level of blackness. Love these <laughs> conversations with you. Um, I am not a mixed race person. I don't have that experience. Um, and so we've talked a lot, especially um, about you being a mixed race person and you moving and, 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 and traveling through your blackness and what that's like. Your mother is a white woman raising three mixed race children in Minnesota. And um, your connection to blackness was what at that point in time? <laughs> I mean, so again, it's 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 multitudes, right? So it, it was yeah. it was it was at once non-existent, but also as I've learned more and more about again blackness as the container blackness as the aesthetic blackness as the ever present undergirding of this whole fucking society right yeah. you cannot have the us without blackness as its foundational um its foundational infrastructure and that it that carries with it again this sense of like resilience and black joy but also just the abundant atrocity that right. occurs when when in some ways white supremacy as as a as a way in which to just strip away mm -hmm. strip away humanity and i feel at its core blackness is that expression of in spite of that we're still going to carry on and, and connect and gather and commune right. um and and that is a tricky thing, especially when it runs in some ways parallel, but completely tangential to the indigenous experience of the U.S. Exactly. And so it's it's again, it's like I I went to 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 UW to learn, right? And so like one of the first uh, classes I took was a class out of the American Indian Studies Department at the University mm -hmm. of Washington, where I learned that my county was named after the Brigadier General that. Um, oversaw the the largest mass hanging in the U.S. of uh, 38 uh, indigenous men um, in Fort Snelling. And so like Sibley County and Sibley East, the high school that I went to, I didn't mm -hmm. learn that in my community. So when it right. comes to, again, like hidden histories and 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 the the choices that are made to destroy those histories and subvert them and cover them up so it's like blackness and the ways in which white supremacy are uh, available tools mm -hmm. are always around and i feel like i grew up in the ignorance of of knowing and and having that like permeate me as i grew mm -hmm. up um, I, I had the opportunity to just be Brian for a while, which, yeah. which I know that uh, a lot of other folks that look like me don't have that experience. And so I learned about my blackness from a very er like intellectual way. And I would always mm -hmm. dip my toe because every summer I'd go back and I'd go see my, you know, my grandparents and, you know, uh, I, right. I, I would, it would always flip. I'd, I'd, and then all of a sudden, like, I'd come back to Minnesota and be like, why are you talking that way? It's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? You know, I would pick up the mannerisms and the accents and the, and the ways in which I would just, again, be. Um, and so, again, it was this, this very boomerangy effect that had no context until I got mm -hmm. to college. And then I started learning a, about the social 
uh, justice context. And then I got into the real world and started experiencing all the things. Uh, right. uh, and then, but, but I also always had the arts when I was yeah. doing that. So when my world was being blown apart, um, spiritually, mentally, physically at times, I always had a space that I could literally, literally work it out. Um, right. Yeah, so uh, both non-existent and, and ever-present. Hmm. How did this time, um, pandemic, <laughs> we're ending the quarter, you <laughs> get this job at Bates College, you're about to move away, and then social unrest happens. Can you walk us through how that affected you? Uh, and I and I, I want to like frame it even more. How did that affect you, being someone who is has a black father and a white mother, and you're moving through all of these different spaces? How did that affect you? Uh, I think another. I've Another privilege that I have is that I'm a Taurus. <laughs> and when, when tragedy strikes me in my life, I tend to sink down in myself and then spread mm -hmm. out to look for who needs help and, and why. It's a defense mechanism um, in many, many ways. Right. Uh, it helps me get through the things to focus on other people. Um, and it makes me, it helps me turn my grief into production um, in some ways. Uh, it's not always healthy because I usually like start overeating and I don't work out anymore. And I'm like, I'm going to take care of everybody else and not myself. Um, but I, I, I also, I, I fell into the work. I was like, I had three months left. I needed to take care mm -hmm. of this course um, and by extension, the 10 students that were with me and also going right. through all of the things. Um, and that fed me. I <clears throat> Creating work also. Creating work also, yep. Um, lopsided and also just, you know, having come off of uh, the choreographer's evening of CD Forum and that process and just more right. and more into um, the world. I, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I've been in Maine for about three months, and I still don't really know how, how much of me got here. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk about like, that a little bit more. What yeah. Do you mean well, I mean, I feel like there's so much, there's so many pieces of me now, it feels like, either in Minneapolis, but specifically coming out of Seattle, that, mm -hmm. that, now being here without a community and kind of total isolation other than being at Bates, um, but also just the ways in which Maine is, is set up and the demographics of the space is just not, mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of people that look like me up in Maine and there aren't a lot of people who are doing the work that I'm doing and there mm -hmm. certainly isn't enough <clears throat> of a critical mass to feel like I'm, I'm as safe as I might have been in a, in a, in a city. Mm -hmm. So I guess how everything hit, especially because uh, I grew up in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. I, have, I had a career in Minneapolis and when, right. and when George Floyd was, was murdered in, in the streets and I'm, and I'm looking at the <clears throat> police precinct and it's burning right next to the venue that I had performed in. 30 50 80 times in my life mm -hmm. <clears throat> it it was it was devastating on a level that i had never really experienced before because at, it was the first time in my life that i had not been home when home was being burnt to the ground mm. and everyone it was like the whole world was watching my home right. <laughs> being devastated um and and there was no recourse right 
And I had started a show back in 2015 after Philando Castile was, was murdered again in the traffic stop. And the show is called Due Process. And uh -huh. in, the, in the state of Minnesota, there isn't the death penalty. <clears throat> and really, like just over half of the states in the U.S. have, have a state death penalty. And mm -hmm. of those, uh, I think it's like 28. And of those, 11 of them haven't used it in over 10 years. So it's like, if you get into the criminal justice system, you could be a mass murderer and you would not be put to death. And the, the sort of paradox and clusterfuck of that is most people's first point of contact with the criminal justice system is a police officer. And if that can result in an execution, there's, there's, there is nothing, there is, again, right. blackness undergirding the foundation of what, is, what justice is supposed to be. Right. So the way the way in which it it just it, it time and time again we are we are we are totally uh exposed to events in life that that show us how far we how far we've come and how far we have yet to go right. And that is not in any way to disparage the efforts that have come before us. It is just to acknowledge that the narrative is that we are much further along than I think that we are. And, exactly. and it's unfortunate, I think, that we have to wait. Not all of us, but a lot of us have to wait. And that's why right now, it's mm -hmm. really interesting watching white America handle this transition right in the ways in which that you know it's all about democracy is an idea right and, and 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 in some ways racism is an idea that has real world consequences and so this this fallacy of democracy being this ever present always going to be there and have our backs thing right. and they're they're watching that crumble uh before them it's it's a it's a terrifying and liberating feeling because that means that us artists have the opportunity to really transform the world like right now we're doing it right now as we speak because we're showing up in spaces and in ways that that there are no more concrete rules because this pandemic climate change social you know racialized social unrest and this terror of democracy that is ripping through this country. Right. How, um, how are you, if you are, using your art to move you through this time? And I also want to say, like, art also can involve rest and not production all the time. Absolutely. And I think that last point, that's the liberating part of, I think, the arts mm -hmm. process. If I could just be in an art process and never have to, like, make a something, uh, right. you know, and get and again, get get a, get livelihood from that. Um, yeah. You know, and I think about like in the, you know, way, way, way back in the day of, of artists who are essentially like subsidized by the community. It's like you mm -hmm. are the you are the storyteller. You are the embodiment of our culture. You are the repository of all the things that help us make sense of this world and this life. Right. Um, and so we got you. You don't have to go do all of the, you know, you don't have to go get your food. We'll bring you food. You know, we don't have to go get you. And that's the thing that I think is, you know, has been systematically erased from our from our U.S. culture is this, this embracing of those who would help us, you know, create our culture and humanity. So for me, I think art um, reminds me of that. And, it, and it's, at this point in my career, it's much more of a, a practice and a necessity than it is a, a thing that I'm going to do. Um, it's just part of what I need to do to make sense of what's going on. And, and if I didn't have teaching and the art, I don't think I would be able to function as well as I usually function.
Right. I I tend to feel like, and again, people have heard me say this again and again, this time period, I'm not so gung-ho about a, a lot of the art being produced right now. Um, and that's my personal opinion is that it's not taken in the space of healing. It's still taken in the space of production. We have to produce this thing. We have to produce this thing. And the thing that you that you hold on to so much, um, again, which is so beautiful, that art, art is about connection. It's about healing. It's about bringing people together. And and what are some of the ways that that's manifesting in you right now? You're in Maine. You don't have that much community. But it's something about that inside of you that I don't think will ever die. Are you tr- are you manifesting that right now? The healing, the connection, the love, the humanity inside of what you're doing. I mean, I'd like to think so. I hope so. I, you know, <laughs> part part of this work, uh, you know, in some ways is a lot of, of faith and trust and um, and you know. Uh, in some ways, like knowing that you're never going to see the fruits of your labor. Um, right. and, and maybe that's <clears throat> an, another way of attaching to this idea of, of, of already failing. So if I'm already failing and I'm trying my best, then the next step to that or, or the next phase of that is, is my best is always... Um, is always in some ways dependent on how the other folks in the room are feeling and, mm-hmm. and, and that, and that their trajectories are always going in the ways that they would like it to. Um, I think one of my, my better skills in the space is, is, is a support and sort of question person. So it's like asking the questions that don't stop a process, <clears throat> but, but help it, you know, propel itself forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so the, I think the manifesting or, or the ways in which that it feels like it, it comes to life is, is really like embracing that imperfection and, and, and that imperfection is the space for change and, mm-hmm. and is the space for happenstance and opportunity and, um, and allowing you it's again it's terrifying because it's the unknown like i don't know what's going to happen um and there is a a bit of me especially within this very fast-paced world like i i wish i had the money to have a publicist or someone that would like help me organize the work so it got got to more people um not because i i want to be the person attached to it because but because i feel like the work that is usually in these spaces again you know community driven work doesn't sell on broadway community driven work does not show up in those big main stage theaters or those big venues of of tv and radio you know there are again there 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 are some rare exceptions i just watched the the hbo fresh prince of bel-air special the reunion Mm -hmm. special um and the ways in which like those moments express themselves on tv but again that they were radical they were like that's not how you do things and that they, they didn't care like mm-hmm. and they didn't know if it was going to work um and you know quincy jones given a platform to you know this young young you know brother from philly who what like where is this coming from? you know where is this going um, right and you know quincy jones being where he was in his in his life like those producers those gatekeepers who were all white, you know, white men being like, okay, you know, so how, how do those spaces create themselves and how do they sustain themselves um, without losing? And again, you know, between CD Forum, every artist I met in CD Forum, it felt like that's what was happening. And and it's like, I want you to have the budget of Amazon because right. could, could we not heal the world then? Um, could we not make a, a, a large impact on how people just are with one another? 
I think I think we could, but again, you know, then then it wouldn't be the work that it is. So it's like trying to trying to hold both both things at right. once. But but that's something that I learned from you. This 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 ardent advocation for artists and the ways in which you must respect the livelihood that is the arts and how do you sustain that and asking those folks who have the platforms to not shirk that duty, that responsibility. Otherwise don't have us in your space, which is a risky thing to say and do, <laughs> you know? So it's a risky thing to say no when people are telling you and whispering in your ear to say yes. And you're just like, it, it's not right. Like, um, I was just having a conversation with someone um, and they're like, if someone gave you a million dollars to do X, Y, and Z, and I was like, there's never enough money to do the thing, especially if it's not coming from a place of heart. I think now, like the older that I've gotten, my art is so, is, is becoming more and more sacred to me that there was a point where it's just like, I want to be famous and I want to do it for this money and I want to do it for that. But it is a tool, art is a powerful tool for healing. And even those that, that the Michael Jacksons and the Princes and the Janet Jacksons, there's still something extremely healing about what they do. So I don't want to take away from that. And it's something sacred about what they do, but it's, it's, it's becoming much deeper for me. Like, I just don't want to do something for the sake of doing it anymore. Like, for the sake of, like, it will just help me do it. It's like, if it doesn't feel right, why am I doing it? You know, the money will come and go, and, and all of that will come and go, but it, it has to be a place where it can be transformative. Yeah. Um, and, and you've done some things that have been extremely transformative. Um, one, folks, go to his website, brianjevans.org, to find out more about Brian. Also, I pinned Brian's Venmo down in the comments. So please, always, I'm always advocating for people to give more money any way that they can. Look, you know, um, we living in that time. So, you know, you're getting a master class from Brian J. Evans right now. <laughs> give Brian some cash, Venmo, at brian-evans-29. And uh, you created a work, um, a continuation of a work, and added some things to it lopsided. So it was, it's, it's a piece that you've done before. And what you said about this, um, for us at CD Form, it premiered on June 13th, 2020. Um, and this was a new, a new iteration of lop lopsided. It was supposed to be in person, and then COVID happened, of course. So could not do it in person. So you created these videos. But what you said, again, it, it just strikes me. In many ways, I don't want to make art about the pain and trauma of being mixed in America, but the hope is that by sharing my perspective, which is made up of many, it will help to humanize us. Why are you always trying to get to the human? And I don't mean that, as, like, I, I just find that beautiful because that's something that I've always been trying to get to. People may not think that about me, but I really am. But you just always, like, your message is like, we are, you know, our humanity, our humanity, our connection. Why is that so important to you? Because uh, I, I just think it'll, it'll, make, it'll make existence um, that much sweeter and joyful. And, and we again, we don't have to wait for the atrocities to happen. Like right. the, the the atrocities are the thing that like helps us and reminds us. Like this time right now is, you know, hopefully for some people, reminding them um, of all the things that they are grateful for and having to hold grief along with grace right. and, and gratefulness. Um, but you'll also see how a lot of this trauma is turning into anger and despair and mm -hmm. um, hatred. And I feel like it, it, it turns into those things when you don't have a good sense of who you are and why, and why people would value you. Um, and if, again, anyone ha would have like a, a, a sort of 
complex about that. It is BIPOC people. It is, it right. is marginalized folk. Um, and yet it's, it feels like sometimes we are the most resilient or we stand in the face of oppression and we're still smiling. And that's because we've had a bunch of practice to figure out that this may be the state of affairs. I'm going to do what I can to change it. But self-care is something that's really important. And right. self-care only occurs when you feel like you're worth taking care of yourself. And, and, I, and, I, and I guess I would extend self-care back to the community because self-care, you can't take care of yourself, right? It, self-care for me is just an acknowledgement that I need help. And so please, community, do the thing that you do. And I, and I hope that I've done enough for my community that, that, um, that they will lift me up as they always do. And that's the other thing. It's like sometimes I don't do enough and yet they still are there. Exactly. Like we still are there. And, I, and the tragedy, I just got done with a, a Nicole, Nicole Brewer anti-racist training. And mm -hmm. she said, um, again, black women, amazing. And she said, you know, the fuckery of white supremacy is that it, it makes everyone feel like they don't have any power. Mm. And, and so I look at it, you know, I look at the current outgoing president and I'm like, you, you don't have anyone around you that loves you. Because if and people I'm loved you, they would be telling you some hard truths. And they yeah. would be they would be bringing you in, but they're letting you go. They are letting you go out on this little weird, fucking dangerous island. Say that. And I feel like that's what it feels like. In my best moments, I have such deep compassion for those folks who are wholly in this and believe of this believing of this fraud, and they're like they're they're not finding their own self value and right. and it is not like the community that they're cultivating has a lot of it around and so that's in my best moments my worst moments <laughs> i swear a lot and so i <laughs> what i what i am i guess trying to remind people of with any of the art that i do or any of the teaching that i do is is that in like number one you're you're worthy of everything you mm. you you are enough in every capacity you are always going to be a work in progress so there even though the world would tell you that there's an expectation that you need to be perfect again right. you, we're always failing I, even just the baseline so it's like me as a person that can be a mantra right but again as society it's like this whole society based on this black infrastructure of atrocity, racism, oppression, misogyny, patriarchy, all the right. things, they're always there. And so even at our, even on my best day, I'm still a misogynist. I'm still, mm. you know, because I have to always constantly break those things down until I don't have to anymore. And so right. it's the given, right, that any one of us could show up in any number of spaces and just be and just be right without fear exactly. of reprisal or without, you know, and, and again, for me, that's the art space. There are moments in time, not always, but there are moments that we, we literally create for us to just be. Right. And, and, and because you can, you can experience that maybe just one time either mm. on stage or in the audience, then that means by definition, it is possible to feel it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it takes a lot of work, but, but there's an example, there's a moment, there's representation in your life of feeling seen and being worthy. And again, if that's possible, then in those rougher moments, you can find that in yourself. And I'm hoping that the art that I create with the people that I create it with Mm -hmm. um, give some tools, empower some people, uh, help them uh, rediscover themselves constantly, uh, and I exactly. and and I and I hope that that is a humanity that that people want to be about.
I, I'm a testament that it does. Um, every time that you perform, I, I learn something new about myself. Every time you speak, I learn something new about myself. Um, and so it is always an honor to speak with you. Um, Lopsided, um, again, can you tell us a little bit about Lopsided? It's a 12 video series. Um, again, you can find that on our Facebook, not our Facebook page. You can go to our website, cdform.org. Um, you can click on CD Form TV and you will find the 12 videos on Lopsided. What is Lopsided to you in these last few minutes? Uh, lopsided is a sort of pick your own adventure uh, series. You could watch one video and that's it. You could watch all of them uh, in succession. You could watch one now and then the rest of them 18 months from now. Um, the cool thing about being digital is that you can watch it in any order and as many times as you want and, you know, get whatever you need from it. Um, right. It is, uh, there's some spoken word, there's some dance, there's some acting, there's, there's some music. Um, my partner, Carrie, uh, is the director of photography on it. And Shout again, out to Carrie. Yep, she's fantastic. Um, and yeah, again, it was, a, it was a way in which to process what was going on we right. made it in in about two months, and it it's meant to be what it is, uh, totally imperfect and of the moment um, of that time, but also tapping into something that's maybe a little bit larger than us. Um, yeah, and again, take what you need and leave the rest. Uh, I I am just you. hoping uh lopsided again is 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 this that feels like a very lopsided world we we are 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 there one thing or the other and and for me i think that is just a that is just a a, a philosophical uh right. uh fallacy right um another thing that i learned in seattle i went to a mixed uh poetry reading and one of the poets was like I used to think of myself as fractions, half this and half that, mm -hmm. never considering that I might be holes of things. And I feel like that is, that's the takeaway um, of a lifetime of feeling like you can be multitudes. You are yes. holes, holes of, of, of many, many, many things, which, which that. mean that you are always greater than you can imagine. Right. So yeah, I, we're coming to time, folks. Again, um, you can connect with Brian at brianjevans.org. Um, you can see what Brian is up to. Uh, you will encounter a very beautiful human being that I hold very close to my heart um, to see lopsided because you're going to want to see Brian perform. Um, there's also videos of Brian and other things on his website, so you can definitely check that out. You can go to cdform.org um, and look under our CD Form TV to see lopsided. And uh, again, Venmo, Brian, slash, Evan, slash, 29. You can pay him also. Um, yeah, I, I, I just sit here and I'm always in awe of you and the way that you think and the way that you move in the world. Um, it's always healing talking to you. Let me just put it that way. It's always just very healing. Um, you are family to me on the realest sense of like what family can be. And I, I thank you for always being present, for always saying yes. Um, one day we'll get to be able to be in each other's presence and love on each other. But until then, we will have our, you know, check-ins when we check in, when we can check in. Um, you know my last favorite question, what is your joy? Uh, I love you so much and, uh, and my joy is the continued opportunity to, um, reflect back, uh, what has been given to me, which has been mm -hmm. so much throughout the years by so many people. And if I come close to being, uh, that reflection, uh, through art or teaching or any expression that I can give out. Um, I feel like that is worth a life. So thank you for the platform and thank you for um, asking that question because it's important. It's not asked enough and there's plenty of joy out there. Uh, yeah. They're just, you know, <laughs> a lot of things that 
uh, would have us believe otherwise. So thank you. Yes. Um, that's it, you all. Again, I just can sit and just listen to Brian talk all day. Um, <laughs> Y'all got a little taste of this person. Uh, hopefully, you all will dig in deeper and find out more about Brian. Um, we will not have intimate conversations next week. It's Thanksgiving, so we're going to take some time off. I'm going to take some time off just to do nothing. Um, and then we will pick it up December 5th with Arif Grassil, um from Pace and a few other things. So you get to know about that human being also. And that is it. We were supposed to do, um, what's that today? What's that today? What's it? Showing out today was supposed to premiere today, the new iteration. But COVID is a bitch, and she hates us all. Um, and so we will be sending out more information about showing out um, in the next few weeks, the next few months. So showing out has not stopped. We're just postponing that because we want to make sure everyone's healthy and safe. Brian, give Carrie my love. I love you. 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 Oh, Gabby. Hey, Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> love you also. Um, and that's it. And Brian, we'll, we'll talk offline. Sounds good. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a beautiful rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. If I can end this thing. I don't know how to end this thing. <laughs>